when I was a theological student many years ago, one thing I learned or was taught was when you get into a church and are pastoring the church and are preaching regularly, uh, it's often good to take a whole book of the Bible and preach through it. In that way, you won't be putting over your pet themes. Uh, you won't repeat yourself uh, week by week, uh, talking about things that are good for you or that you like, but which won't necessarily uh, benefit the congregation. It's good to take a book of the Bible and go through it, and in that way, you can't avoid difficult themes either. Now, um, it so happens that our pastor, Steve, and myself, we're graduates of the same theological college. And uh, he has been led to uh, uh, lead us through the Gospel of Mark week by week by week. And uh, one theme that we would be tempted to avoid, if we could, would be this passage that Liam has just read to us. Ministering to a boy who was possessed by a demon. I'd prefer not to preach on that, and uh, could I just seriously say to any uh, parents or children, try and be sensitive to what happened, but Liam's uh, read the story. Last week we looked at Jesus when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and there he was uh, uh, changed and his clothing was glistening white and there were three disciples with him, there was uh, Peter and John and James, and they were overwhelmed by the glory of Jesus and who he was. And then the very next uh, uh, bit in the Bible following on through that is that Jesus comes down from the mountain, down to uh, level ground, and walks straight into an argument. And the argument was uh, between the other nine disciples that didn't go up the mountain and the teachers of the law that were there in that place at that time. If you have your Bibles, you might like to follow through on some of the, the references that we're going to be making um, in Mark chapter 9. In verse 14, we read that when they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. So it's on for young and old. Uh, what are they arguing about? They're arguing about the fact that here is a boy and uh, obviously possessed and controlled by a demonic spirit and the disciples were powerless to cast that spirit out of that boy. And the teachers of the law were there and, and uh, they thought they knew how to do it. Now, we're not told the, the detail of the argument, but I think this would be probably what happened. The teachers of the law and the other nine disciples uh, are, are going hammer and tong. And uh, I can imagine the teachers of, law, of the law saying, who gave you fellows the authority to try and do what you're trying to do? And of course their response is, well, Jesus did. Well, why can't you do it? If Jesus has given you the authority to do it, why can't you do it? Uh, and then I said, if, if you're t attempting to try and cast out an evil spirit, and they're coming now from the, uh, the legal perspective, what we do, if we're trying to do it, we read from the Bible, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You've got to read that if you want to try and cast out a demon. And, and, and Psalm 91, which was the other thing that the Jewish people uh, would read when they were trying to deliver somebody from an evil spirit. Psalm 91, he will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you'll find refuge. You'll not fear the arrow that flies by day. You didn't read that and you try to cast out a demon. Uh, you haven't done that. If I was a disciple, I would have responded, neither did you. Uh, you think you can do it just like that? And the disciples respond with something like, well, we've done it before. Jesus taught us to do it and we've done it before. And, uh, uh, and while this argument is going on, the whole time there is a boy a disturbed boy, a very disturbed boy, lying on the ground. And we, we hear the story from his father, as Liam read to us. 
His father comes to Jesus. In, in, in the middle of all this argument, his father comes to Jesus. Distraught. My son's been robbed of speech. This demon seizes him and throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth. His whole body turns rigid. He gnashes his teeth. And I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't. Now, this, this, this account of this attempt at deliverance, it raises a number of questions for us. And I want, want, want us to, this morning to focus on these, these questions. The first one is spiritual failure and helplessness. I'm sure you have been in that uh, situation where you have said to yourself, why can't I do something here, whether it's in, in, a, in relation to an evil spirit or, or something else? Spiritual failure and helplessness is something that we experience. The second thing is that it raises the why question. Here is a boy, not a man, not a, not a woman. Here is a boy. Why would a boy be possessed by an evil spirit? The next question it raises is, how do we deal with it if we're confronted by evil in this way or otherwise? How, how do we deal with it? And how do we minister to children if we discern that children are affected by evil? And the last question, which is a good one, how did Jesus create hope? How did Jesus create hope for that man in that time? And how does Jesus create hope for us in our time? And all of those questions are asked and answered in this particular Bible story. First of all, spiritual failure and helplessness. I'm sure you have experienced times when you are like the disciples, swimming in the deep end, out of, de out of your depth, over your head. Uh, they didn't know what to do. And even if they'd done it before, which they had, they were powerless on this day. They'd been with Jesus and they had witnessed and experienced his power to deliver people from evil. Mark chapter 3, we, we, we've uh, uh, been through this. He sent them out to preach and to have authority over demons. Jesus gave them that authority. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. Mark chapter 6 and verse 12, they, this is them, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. And now they're attempting to do it again, and they can't. Lesson number one is we can't rely on yesterday's success to get us through today and what we have to do today. We can't rely today on what we did and were able to do yesterday. Every day is a new day. Every, every situation is a new challenge requiring our our being filled with the Spirit of God in order to do the work of God. Why? Why was a boy possessed by an evil spirit? There's a natural tendency within us to, to want to know why. If this person is uh, uh, going through this, why? If this person is suffering, why? What happened for this to happen? There has to be some reason. We know that if it is an adult and we're, we're dealing with uh, evil and an evil spirit, uh, it is normally because of some occult activity that that person has been involved in. Uh, anyone who gets involved in any occult activity is opening up their life to demonic influence. Or if it's a, a commitment to sin, to, to, to live in a certain way and to continue to live in a certain way that we know is, is not of God, 
that to continue to do something and not to repent of it, then we open the door for demonic influence. The Apostle Paul taught that when he wrote a letter to Timothy and uh, he talked about a couple of uh, men, Hymenaeus and Alexander. You'll remember them, don't you? Hymenaeus and Alexander. Uh, Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 1 verses 19 and 20, holding on to faith and a good conscience, some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. Now the principle there is, is these guys are committed to continue to blaspheme the holy name of God. They're, they're supposed to be believers. They're supposed to be uh, Christian, yet they go around continually uh, blaspheming the name of God and uh, Paul says uh, that opens the door for them to be handed over to Satan so that they can learn. So uh, sin, uh, occult activity opens the door. But we're talking about a boy. What has a boy been able to do so that he is uh, in this situation? What's he done? Why is a boy controlled by an evil spirit? Do you know what? Jesus didn't answer that question. And uh, there's a lot that we can learn from that too. We do not have all the answers. Uh, I do not know why. Jesus didn't say why. He didn't uh, uh, answer that particular question. He simply said to the boy's father, how long has he been like this? And the father said, well, from childhood. So we assume he was an older boy and from a very young age he had been affected and afflicted. And that demonic spirit was simply needing an eviction order. No right to be in a boy's life and needed to be gotten out. The next question I want to simply ask and answer is how do we then deal with demonic things that we might see around us? How do we deal with it? Most of us won't have to do with demonic possession. Some of you might uh, wipe the brow and thank you very much. Most of us won't have to deal with demonic possession. But we all have to deal with the devil in certain ways, his schemes, his wiles, his strategies, and take a stand against the devil because we are Christian. Simply by being followers of Christ, we are enemies of the evil one. Now, something that helps me in, in understanding uh, the work of the enemy is to understand the spectrum that, that there is of, of our enemy's activities. It's quite a wide spectrum. At one end, we have temptation. At the other end, we have possession, like, like this boy. At the temptation end, uh, we all, we all um, are tempted to sin and to do the wrong thing, including Jesus. The next step along that, that spectrum is sin, where we actually commit to do something that uh, is not of God, is wrong, and everyone, all of us, have sinned apart from Jesus. And then as we go along the spectrum, there are things like addictions and obsessions that uh, the enemy can use and capitalise on. And when we talk about children and young people, we're into an area where, where they can be very much uh, involved. Did anyone watch the uh, Australian story on Monday night on the ABC? It was talking about addictions that children particularly have in gaming, in, in screen time, and, and the games that they play with each other or by themselves, and the addiction 
the addiction that that that, that uh, uh, creates in their lives. It changes their mood. It changes their even changes their mind structure, changes their behaviour, and that uh, changes them as people. And whenever that happens, it's not just not just the game or the thing or the device. It's the work of the enemy using those things. And then we have mind control, so going along further again on that spectrum. Mind control. What makes a, 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 a teenage girl look at herself and think, I am not as beautiful as that one or that one, or I'm too fat, and then have a, an eating disorder that, that controls her mind and changes her life. Now, it's not demonic possession, but when, when the wrong mindset has been allowed to be created, we've given the enemy a platform and a ground to operate from. And then there is demonic oppression, where you can go sometimes for, for days or weeks and this heaviness is over you and you don't know what to do, you don't know how to get out of it apart from to pray, Lord, Lord, get me out of this, I, I, I've had enough. Until we finally reach the end stage where someone can be demonically possessed. And so we need to understand what we are dealing with. We need to understand what, what is happening in us because the Lord expects us to be able to deal with it. It has a spreading influence. Way back in 1850, Mrs Patterson lived in Albury, sort of just on the edge of town, and she had a beautiful garden. And uh, Mrs Patterson wanted to enlarge her garden, and so she got these uh, nice seeds from overseas that, that she grew and produced a very nice, attractive purple flower. Oh, lovely. And she, she, she grew this in her garden. And because this uh, a flower um, produced hundreds of seeds in every, in every uh, growing season, it wasn't long before Mrs. Patterson had these beautiful purple flowers all through her garden. And then uh, she thought the neighbours might like some, but she didn't have to sort of give them away. The birds picked them up and spread them to the neighbours' gardens. And, and so... Uh, Albury started to look purple. And somehow it crossed the Murray, probably from, from uh, birds, uh, uh, bringing the seeds here into Victoria, of all places, to uh, make Victoria look beautiful. And if you drive up the freeway from here to Albury in October, it's this beautiful covering of purple from uh, Mrs Patterson's flowers. And across the Warby Ranges, uh, Western Victoria, got into South Australia, and somehow, I don't know how this happened, but, but, but the seeds of Mrs. Patterson's flowers crossed the Nullarbor and landed in Western Australia, and WA looks uh, beautiful purple in October. So that uh, 30 million hectares of Southern Australia is covered by Mrs. Patterson's beautiful purple flower. Now, the purple flower apparently doesn't taste too good. Um, there are toxins in it. And, and about $250 million a year, it costs the grazing industry for, for lost, uh, lost grazing land through, through the loss of pasture. But the people in South Australia, you know, our cousins over there, um, they, they found that Mrs Patterson's beautiful purple flower, uh, which of course here we call Patterson's Curse, they, they, they realised that in a drought, in a drought it, it, it is one of the few um, plants that stays alive. And even, even though the cattle and sheep, it's bad for them, in a drought, they would eat it 
gave them a bellyache, but, but they, they ate it and it kept them alive until the normal um, herbage and grass grew again. So in South Australia, uh, they called this uh, uh, cursed plant Salvation Jane. Hey! The curse in South Australia became a blessing. And we know that when we look at, at the, the enemy's work, whatever it is, that we are able to take that and make that into a blessing. <clears throat> and when we, when we look at children in particular and how we minister to children, we are able by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to take, take whatever has been, been negative and destructive in their life and change that which has cursed them into a blessing for them. When Jesus met that boy and his father, and inevitably the, the disciples with them, he was exasperated. When he talked to his, his uh, nine disciples, I can't quite imagine the feeling in his heart, but listen to his words. Oh, unbelieving generation, how long am I to stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Clear frustration. Bring the boy to me. And the Bible tells us that when the spirit in the boy saw Jesus, it threw him into a convulsion. He fell to the ground. He rolled around and, and, and the terrible expressions and, and uh, uh, signs of this, this demonic spirit were expressed. And the father comes to Jesus and says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus says a funny thing back to him. He says, if you can, if you can, everything is possible for him who believes. And the father replied, I do believe. Help me in my unbelief. There's still... <laughs> Something in there that, that I've had this going on for so long, I, I, I just can't believe 100%. Please, please help me. Now, now, for a lot of Christians, I'll rephrase that, for some Christians, they would say, ah, oh, he didn't have enough faith to, uh, to, to, to help his son. Um, uh, this happened because I haven't got enough faith. This happens because I didn't believe the right thing. This happened because I didn't pray the right words. Uh, in this man's lack, Jesus makes it up. I do believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. And on the basis of that expression of faith, as uh, qualified as it was and as limited as it was, the Lord Jesus rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. And he took the boy by the hand and lifted him up. Now, how did Jesus create hope for, for the future? How did he create hope for us? When the disciples came to him in private after, they asked the inevitable question, what was wrong with us? Why couldn't we drive it out? And his response was, this kind, and the, the, his answer is very interesting, I think, this kind can come out only by prayer. What kind? Well, he called it a deaf and mute spirit. But we read in the Bible that there are many kinds of demons. There are many kinds of evil spirits. We're told in Ephesians 6 and verses 11 and 12 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Some are rulers. It's against the authorities against the power of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a range of demons and a range of jobs and a range of tasks that they have, and the Bible mentions a lot of those. As C.S. Lewis uh, 
taught in his book, Screw Tape Letters. Uh, demons are sent out on assignment. They're given a, an assignment to, to, uh, to operate in a certain way in a certain situation and in certain people. This kind, said Jesus, the kind that we're dealing here is a deaf and mute spirit and it can come out only by prayer. Well, how do we pray? How do we pray? We're told in Ephesians 6 and 18, again, pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. What, what, what sort of, what's, there's all these kinds of demons, what, are, what kinds of prayer are we to pray? Don't, don't we just pray? Again, Paul taught Timothy in 1 Timothy 2 and verse 1 that requests, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all men. So there's a sort of a range of expression. And in, in the case of a demon, we pray. We pray prayers that are appropriate and all prayers. We pray prayer plus. You know, some Bible versions add pray and fast. Putting ourselves in a situation where we can pray. Now, most of us here this morning, I would say, aren't dealing with anything like this. We're not dealing with anything like we see here in Mark chapter 9. But we are all involved in spiritual warfare. Angie's already uh, referred to that this morning. We are all involved in spiritual battles. And just for us personally, one, one, one verse that's uh, encouraged Mark and I this week in our life, and We've had a bit of a up and down week in certain ways. But this encouraged us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. But let's finish by, by thinking about how we can stand in for a child in prayer. How we can minister to a child in that range, that spectrum where, where they are influenced and they are affected some very strongly in our families, in our schools. Kids are under pressure, spiritual pressure. And I want us to conclude this morning by thinking how we how we can pray for them. I just want to pray in a moment, and if you have someone in your family, someone in your um, sphere of influence, some child, some young person in particular, because I, I, I feel the Lord wants us to, to, to think of them today. So we've had, had this story about this, this boy. If there's someone in your family or your environment. As I pray, I wonder if you might stand for them. Simply stand and, and have them on your mind as we pray and commit them to the Lord. Stand in for them. Take a stand for them and pray that God's blessing will be upon them. I'd like to pray, and if you have someone on your heart, on your mind, just stand with me. I'm, I'm standing for someone, even though I'm standing to speak, I'm standing for somebody. That we can commit these children, young people, to the Lord for their blessing. They're not demon-possessed, but for their blessing. Father, we stand before you because you are our loving Father. Our Father who has created us and created the people, the children, the young people that we stand for. And Lord, we want to commit them to you, each individually in our own mind. We commit to you, these young people, that there be deliverance, from addiction, deliverance from oppression, 
deliverance from the things that, that control them, that they have no control over. And that can be such a, an opening for the evil one. We pray for them. And we pray that in the name of Jesus, there be deliverance, there be freedom, there be your grace and your love and your power ministered to them. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.